There's an ancient legend that's recorded in a book called The Man with Dirty Hands. And I want you to hear this as we begin. The boy became involved with the ruffians of the village who persuaded him to join them in a robbery of his own father's treasury house. After the robbery was over, his friends fled with the stolen treasure and left him to face the guilt of the crime alone. The young man was desperate. He was deserted by his friends and he had betrayed the trust of his father. But his greatest crime was that he had brought public dishonor on the family name. And in a culture where ancestors are worshiped and family integrity is a sacred trust, this was the worst wrong of all. Broken and deeply repentant, he went to his father and begged forgiveness. Graciously, it was granted. The father called all the members of the family together to celebrate the reconciliation and the return of his son. When all had enjoyed the banquet to the fullest, the father stood and lifted his cup of rice wine for a toast. But as the son drank deeply the contents of his cup, he grabbed his throat and fell lifeless across the table. The son had been poisoned. The father, with ceremonial dignity, nodded to the guests. Each in turn graciously and politely bowed to the father as they silently left the banquet hall. All was now put right. The son had paid the price of his pardon with poison. His honor had been restored. The family integrity and honor were reestablished. The unfortunate incident was closed. I wanted to begin this sermon by reading that story because I think it's, it shocks us. Because this morning we're looking at the story of the lost son, the story of the prodigal son, as Jesus told it in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and following. And I think some of us are so used to that story, have heard it so many times, that we fail to grasp how the first century readers would have heard this, or those who were with Jesus that day, how they would have received the story. It would have been extraordinary to them that the father would respond to his son in this way. And what I wanna do this morning is to answer this basic question. When we have wandered from God, can we go home again? Can we return to our father in heaven? When we have made mistakes, when we have blown it in life, can we go home again? This morning we're concluding the series looking at real questions. And it's been our hope that you've seen in the Bible that it's okay for us to ask God hard questions. It's okay for us to wrestle with God with some of the disappointments in life. Real questions, real emotions. The reality is, as we read the scriptures, we see really every emotion that we will experience in our own lives. These were real people like you and me. But then we see real faith. It doesn't end with the question. It doesn't end with the emotions, the raw emotions. It ends in faith. And what we've seen is that as people have wrestled with God, as they've come to God with their questions, and in their pain, God ministers to them. And he restores them. And he does an amazing work. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to begin actually by reading the first couple of verses in Matthew chapter, I mean Luke chapter 15. Listen to what we read. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered to themselves, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus goes on to tell three parables, but we need, that, we need to understand these parables in light of why Jesus tells them. He tells them to the religious leaders and to the people who the religious leaders have deemed unworthy, unworthy of the attention of Jesus, and Jesus tells them these three parables, a story about a lost sheep, a story about a lost coin, and a story about a lost son. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we ask that you would bless this time that you have provided. 
Give us insight. Give us understanding of your truth. Lord, we want to be transformed by your truth this morning. We want to be changed, Lord. If we have built and erected any walls around our hearts and around our minds to keep you at a distance because of the shame of our sin, we pray that you would break through those walls today, that we may hear what you want us to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Three questions that I want you to consider this morning as we walk together through the story of the prodigal son, the story of the lost son, beginning in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Here's the first thing, the first question that I want you to think about this morning. Do you identify with the younger son who walked away from God? Do you identify with this younger son who rejects his father? who walks away from his father, who basically says to his father, I don't want to have a relationship with you. As we look at this, here's the first thing that I want you to see as we go through this story that Jesus told. And that's the sin of the younger son, which is rejecting God. Rejecting God. We read in verses 11 to 16, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The, other, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Estate planning at the time of Jesus was actually very simple. When the father of a home died, his estate was divided evenly among his living sons, although a double portion was given to the oldest son, as well as the right to sit in his father's seat, the right to be the, the patriarch of the family. So in this instance, where the younger son comes to the father and asks for his inheritance early, this was never done. This, was, this just never happened. In fact, one scholar said that today, even today in the Middle East, if a son one came to his father and said, I want my inheritance early, it would be a huge scandal. In the generations that came, according to Jewish tradition, if a child came to their father and said, I want my inheritance early, they would actually have a funeral for the living son because he would no longer be seen as a son. He would no longer be seen as a member of the family. He would be treated as if he had died. What this son did was scandalous. Essentially, what he was saying to his father was this, I don't want to have a relationship with you. I don't want to be um, accountable to you. I don't want to be responsible to you. It's as if he's saying to his father, I wish you were dead. But the response of the father is rather remarkable. The father, instead of what he would normally happen where the son would be brought before the elders of the village and would be publicly humiliated for what he had asked for, the father gives his son what he asked for. What we read is that he broke his estate, divided it among his sons. Again, it wouldn't have been equal. His, old, his oldest son would have received an extra portion. And we see that the younger son goes off, probably as far as he could get, goes to another country. Because he wants to get away from his father. He gets, wants to get away from his family. He's rejected them. And he goes off to a distant land. And there he squanders his wealth. A famine hits the land about the time that his money runs out. Jobs are scarce. And the only job that he can find is feeding the pigs. And he pay, was paid so little that he longed to eat the pods that the pigs were eating. What I want you to think about here is the sin of the younger son, which was rejecting his father. 
Friends, what happens to us is often in life, we do what Adam and Eve did. We do what we see throughout scripture, throughout history. What, the, what, what this, this young, younger brother does, what this young son does, is he walks away from his father, he rejects his father, and he says, I don't wanna live according to your rules. I don't wanna live in responsibility to you. I don't wanna be accountable to you. And we do that every time we sin. Friends, sin is more than, hey, I made a mistake. Sin is saying to God, I don't trust you, I don't believe in you, and so I believe I have a better plan for my life. That is a rupture of a relationship. It is rejecting God. When we sin, we are rejecting God. This is serious business, but it's something that often we don't take seriously. So we see that the nature of the sin is the rejection of God. The second thing, as we continue through the story, we see the son's response, which is repentance. Now, before I read the passage, let me explain what repentance is. Repentance is recognizing that I have walked away from God, recognizing that I am living in sin, recognizing that I've turned my back on God, and it's doing a 180. It's turning around, coming back to God, and embracing God, and living again the life that God has called me to live. It's confessing my sin and changing the way that I live. And so we read on, and we read this. Verses 17 to 21, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I love the way this passage begins in verse 17. When he came to his senses. How many times have we said that as Christians? I can think of many times in my life when I have come to my senses and I've realized that I have wandered from God. And I've realized that I long to go home again. I long to be the person that God has created me to be. I long to be the person that I was before. You see, like the sun, we realize when we come to our senses, this is what we recognize. We recognize that because of our sin, we have invited into our lives an emptiness that can never be filled. We have brought into our lives a hunger that can never be satisfied, a thirst that can never be quenched. And that's what the younger son recognizes. And what he recognizes is he comes to a place, as he comes to his senses, he realizes, I want to go home again. My father is better to his servants than I'm being treated here. It's when I'm with my father that I am loved. And he recognizes, and do you notice what he does? He comes home in humility. He says to his father, against heaven and against you I have sinned. Father, forgive me for what I have done. I do not deserve to be treated as a son. Will you receive me back as a servant? The humility of the younger son is extraordinary. It's, and it's exemplary for you and me. Here is a, is a man who is taking his sin seriously. Here is someone who recognizes that his sin is more than breaking a rule. It's more than breaking a law. It's rupturing and breaking a relationship. And the younger son, understanding that, comes back to his father and he says with humility, oh father, forgive me, for I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. 
Now, what is the father's response? That's the third part as we look at the younger son. Here's the father's response. It's one of grace and mercy. We read in verses 22 to 24, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Nobody would expect that the father would respond in this manner. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the way that God responds when any of his children who have walked away from him come back to him. Remember the context of why Jesus tells the stories? He's being surrounded by tax collectors who are con considered unclean sinners, prostitutes, sinners, common people, sinners in the eyes of the religious community. And the religious community is saying to themselves and to one another, why is he spending time with this rabble? God doesn't care about them. God cares about us because we're good people. What is God saying? He's saying that all of us, no matter where we've been, we can go home again. Now, how does the father receive his son? Does he punish his son? No. The, son, the father is overjoyed at the return of his son. You get the impression as you read that every day the father is going out, looking out onto the horizon, waiting every day, longing that he would see his son who had left, who had run away, his son who had, who had rejected him, longing to see that his son would return again. And then one day as he looked under the horizon, he saw his son coming. And what did he do? He ran to him. And the Bible says that he kissed him. Now, the original Greek lang language means that he covered him. He covered his son with kisses. He was so overjoyed. He was so, um, so wonderfully excited at the return of his son. So what does he do? He not only covers his son with kisses, but he has a robe placed on him. The robe represented a place of honor. He's saying to his son, you are taking a place of honor in my home. But he does more than that. He has sandals placed on his feet. He probably has become so poor that he's had to travel without sandals. And so the father is taking care of the needs of his son. He's not rejecting him as his son rejected him. It's what we would expect. It's what we, we, what we would anticipate. It's certainly what the religious leaders in that day expected. But it's not how the story would proceed. Then he does something very interesting, which some of you need to hear this. He orders that a ring be placed on his, on his son's finger. What is that about? The ring, I think, is the most significant thing that the father does for the son. The ring represents that this man is received back, not as a servant, but as a son. That the boy has been received back with all of, of the wonder and all of the responsibility and all of the joy of being a son to this amazing father in this home and in this family. You see, because he received this ring, it marks him as a member of the family. It marks him as, a, as one who can now even conduct business on behalf of the, fun, of the family. Now, wait a minute. This is the son that squandered so much of the father's resources. And yet the father gives him a place of responsibility as a son, as a member of his family. Friends, some of you have made mistakes in your life and God has forgiven you as you have come and confessed that and changed the way that you lived. But you have not allowed God to say to you, you are my child. Welcome home. You have responsibility and you have gifts and blessings as part of my family. Be restored as a member of my family. 
I wonder if this is what you need to hear today. I wonder if today some of you have even shirked away from taking responsibility in the kingdom of God because you've made mistakes in the past. Yes, you still live with the implications and ramifications of those mistakes. God allows us to live with the consequences of our choices. But God sees you differently than the world sees you. God sees you differently maybe than your family sees you. God looks at you and he says, you are my child and I want to use you to change the world. Get back in the game. Get back on the field. Do you recognize yourself in the older child today? I mean, I'm sorry, in the younger son today. Do you look at your life and see, that's me. That's me. And I need to go home today. Maybe you think you're home, but you realize that your, your vision of God is one that he's, he's an ogre, he's angry, he wants to punish, and he wants to, he wants to make your life miserable because of the mistakes that you've made. And, and for you, coming home is seeing God in a different light. Or maybe for you, maybe for you, you're that tax collector, you're that prostitute, you're that person who's wandered from God. He's opening his arms to you and he's saying, come home. Repent. Come home back to me in humility, acknowledging what you have done, and change your ways. Be my child again. The second thing I want you to see, question I want you to wrestle with this morning is this. Do you identify with the older son? Do you identify with the older son who lives like the religious leaders did, with pride and entitlement, pointing at the mistakes of others, looking at others and saying, they should never be part of the church. The church should never reach out to them. God doesn't want them, whoever them are, God doesn't want them in the kingdom. Let's look at the sin of the older son. Often we stop with the younger son, but there's much to learn with the older son. I'm going to take just a few moments to describe him. What is his sin? His sin is rejecting God as well, but different, differently than the way of the, his younger brother. Verse 25 to 28, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. That word angry actually is better translated rage. He was enraged that his father would extend grace and mercy to his younger brother. He is enraged and angry that his son was not punished for what he had done. Now, the older son is the son we think we want. It's the one that is faithful and continues to work in the family business. But there's something deeper going on in the heart of this older son. Where his younger brother walked away, the older son remained, but had a heart that was very cold. And it was not the heart of his father. The heart of his father was for both of his sons. The heart of God is for all people that he has created in the world. That is the heart of God. And those who follow God, those who are part of the family of God, our hearts are to resonate and to be passionate about the, the things that God loves, the things, the people that God cares about, which are all people because all people are made in the image of God. And so what we see is that he is rejecting the heart of his father. He is rejecting the love of his father. Now remember, Jesus is speaking here to the response of the Pharisees and the religious leaders who are criticizing Jesus for extending love and hospitality and compassion and mercy and ministry to the very people that the religious leaders and the Pharisees have rejected and have said, have no place in the kingdom of God. 
I think sometimes we can be like this older son. We can be those who say, the kingdom is not for you. The kingdom is not for you. Or we can say to people, you're not allowed in the church. You're not welcome in the church until you get yourself cleaned up. We don't want you here. That is not the heart of God. That is rejecting the heart of God. We are to have hearts that resonate with the hearts of the heart of God, or we are committing the sin of the older son. I want you to see a second thing in this story, and that is the son, the response of the son. And what does he do? He justifies his sin. In verses 28 and following. So his father went out and pleaded with the older son. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now, on one level, I get it. This isn't fair. This doesn't seem fair. Why are you celebrating my younger brother who rejected you? And the father says, son, I love both of you. And we're going to see in just a moment the father's response. But the son justifies his sin where his younger brother repented and turned and came home again the older brother, there's no sense as the story ends that he ever comes home. And indeed, the religious leaders are a thorn in the work of God through Jesus Christ. They are the ones who who instigate the crucifixion of Jesus. Their heart does not resonate with the heart of God. Friends, If we are to make an impact in this community and in this world, we can't be like the older son. We have to be ones who, who embrace the heart of God and allow the things that he's passionate about to be our passion as well, to see the world as he sees it, which means we need to confront our attitudes where we are looking at others and we are criticizing and critiquing them, we are saying they have no place in the kingdom. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't speak of the truth and love to help people to be free of their sin. Certainly we do, to encourage them to come to God and to reject their sin, to come to God in humility. Certainly we do. But friends, we don't, what we don't do is to point at people and say, you have no place here. You are not welcome here. You do not belong here. God loves all people, for all people are made in his image. In the last couple weeks, we've seen our nation torn apart because of the murder of George Floyd. And many of us, uh, if not all of us, have been just deeply pained by what we saw. Friends, racism is sin. People of every color, of every race, of every ethnicity are equal in the eyes of God, have equal value in the eyes of God. I remember many, many years ago when I was a teenager and next door we had an interracial couple move in. They bought the home right next to us. We didn't think anything of it. In fact, I was very shocked when my dad shared with me that some people in the neighborhood, led by a guy who held himself out as, a, as, this, as this very committed Christian, they wrote a petition. They wrote a petition to say that this couple was not welcome in our neighborhood. They had approached my mom and dad, and my parents said, no, we won't sign that. No way. And I remember when the petition was given, somehow my parents found out that their names had been written in even though they never signed it. And they totally disagreed with it. My parents went next door and embraced that couple and said, this is not us. 
we did not sign this, and we are so sorry that you had to go through this. We disagree with them. You are welcome in this neighborhood. You are welcome as our neighbors. I remember how broken I was as a young Christian at that point to know that a Christian was behind this whole thing. How can any believer look at anybody else because of their race, because of their ethnicity, because of their lifestyle, because of the way they dress, because of their economic situation, because of their past, whatever. How can any of us look at anybody made in the image of God and do that and reject them? When the heart of our God is that every person would come to know him through faith in Jesus Christ. And so how does, how does the Father respond? Again, with grace and mercy. My son, the Father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Do you hear the heart of the Father? Jesus is talking about the heart of our Father in heaven who longs that all people would come to know him because those in the world are, who don't know him are dead, spiritually dead and lost. And it's the heart of God that all people would come alive in Jesus Christ. That heart is the heart that God wants us to have as individuals, and because we have them as individuals, we have it as a church. Let us be those who reflect the heart of the Father. Let me close with this story. It's written by Timothy Keller, who's uh, just an incredible pastor and author. And listen to what he says. He says, Christmas is about receiving presents, but consider how challenging it is to receive certain kinds of gifts. Some gifts, by their very nature, make you swallow your pride. Imagine opening a present on, on Christmas morning from a friend, and it's a book on dieting. Then you take off another ribbon and wrapper, and, you, and it's another book from another friend called Overcoming Selfishness. If you say to them, thank you so much, you're in a, in a sense you're admitting, for indeed I am overweight and obnoxious. In other words, some gifts are hard to receive because to do so is to admit that you have flaws and weaknesses and you need help. Perhaps on some occasion you have had a friend who figured out you were in financial trouble, came to you and offered a large sum of money to get you out of your predicament. If that has ever happened to you, you probably found that to receive the gift meant swallowing your pride. There has never been a gift offered to us that makes you swallow your pride to the depths than the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do. The gospel teaches that we are lost, so unable to save ourselves that nothing less than the death of the Son of God himself can save us. That means you are not somebody who can pull yourself together and live a good and moral life. Friends, I hope everybody listening to this sermon this morning can see themselves in the story somewhere. I hope that you are not like the older son who is, who is, being, who is justifying their sin. Would each of us face the reality of our brokenness? May we reflect the heart of our Father. Oh God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being our Father in heaven. Thank you that you have restored us, that you have renewed us, that you have loved us. Lord, may we hear what we need to hear today through the, through, through the voice of the Holy Spirit, that we would repent as the younger son does, and we would go home again. For Lord, that is the question. Will we go home again? Will we go home again? In Jesus' name, amen.